I'd like to tell you a story. A story about two users at an enterprise company and their modernization journey using IBM's private and public cloud. Meet Todd and Jane. Todd is operations lead and Jane is the development lead for an enterprise company. They built a pretty great app running in WebSphere called StockTrader. Here's a peek at it. This app provided their business a simple way to manage their clients' stock portfolios. It ran in WebSphere, was built with a few WAR files, and to be honest, it took a long time to enhance the app. StockTrader and WebSphere also used a traditional DB2 database, which was running in their data center, and they successfully depended on it for years. But while StockTrader was fine, everyone in the company wanted something better. The product managers wanted to add social media to their loyalty program. Well, Jane was excited because she could now refactor the app into microservices. Todd loved the idea of cloud efficiency, but that data needed to stay local. So Jane and her team got to work architecting a microservices stock trader, complete with DB2, MQ, and Redis services, and how it would connect to public cloud and social media. Todd then took those requirements and installed and configured IBM Cloud Private so Jane could deliver StockTrader. Next, they used Transformation Advisor and were guided how to move StockTrader from WebSphere into IBM Cloud Private. Jane clicked StockTrader and saw the recommendations, that she should run each WAR file in Liberty, and that most of the migration would be simple, with one moderate migration. As Jane clicked Migration Details, she sees that Transformation Advisor provides deployment files that she can use to perform the migration. Sweet! Now, let's take a look at how they used IBM Cloud Private. Todd can manage his cloud by logging in, viewing the dashboard, and navigating to work with most any resource, including compute nodes, storage, or in this case, the catalog of services he wants to deploy for Jane. For example, he knows Jane needs DB2, so he searches, and sure enough, sees two Helm charts he can deploy. Then he searches for Redis, and finds a few options he can choose from, from the Kubernetes community. Finally, he searches for MQ, and sees IBM MQ. He selects it, and sees all kinds of details in the readme on how to optimize the deployment of the service into IBM Cloud Private. Once those Helm charts are deployed, Todd can manage the deployments through the Workloads menu. Here he can see everything that's deployed into the private cloud, including the services Jane needs, and he can even filter on stock trader namespace to focus on Jane's work. Ah, and here it looks like Jane's been very busy and has already deployed the stock trader microservices. Finally, Todd can manage the deployed services like MQ from MQ's admin console, and he can even use DSM, running in IBM Cloud Private, to manage his multiple databases across his data center from one UI. Meanwhile, Jane now has an improved stock trader running, and everyone is very happy. In fact, IBM Cloud Private is so successful, they want to make that a production environment, and now they need a consistent dev test environment running in IBM's public cloud. Initially, Todd and Jane's goal is just to make StockTrader work in public using the exact same services and code. Todd creates an instance of IBM Cloud Container Service, or IBM Kubernetes Service, with a simple UI click, and IBM prepares it for him. Now Todd can manage both production and dev test clouds in a consistent way. Here is an initial glimpse of the overview dashboards where Todd can see general cluster health. He can then look at the compute nodes used by each cluster. Notice that Cloud Private has worker, master, management, and proxy nodes, whereas Public Cloud has only worker nodes, since the rest is managed by IBM. It's important to point out that while the browser UIs have some visual differences, the CLI is nearly identical. Here, Todd can run kubectl get nodes on both clouds and see the results he wants. Further, he can manage the entire cluster using the kubectl command line. Here, he's looking at all the resources running in each Kubernetes cluster. Todd can also manage kube resources from the browser UI. Here, Todd starts back at the dashboard view of IBM Cloud Private and Cloud Public. 
What Ty noticed is that in IBM's public cloud, they offer the Kubernetes open source dashboard view to manage detailed clustered resources. Here, he can view the deployments across the cluster and even filter based on namespace, just like he did in Cloud Private. To test it out, Todd goes back to Cloud Private's workloads deployment view, and he's quite pleased at how he can manage deployments in a similar way across the clusters. He filters the Cloud Private view, sees the stock trader microservices, and then moves to the public deployments, filters to see only the stock trader namespace, and notices Jane has not yet deployed into the public dev test cloud. So let's take a look at how Todd got consistent middleware into the dev test cloud. Remember, initially, Todd and Jane's goal is to just make Stock Trader work in public using the same exact services and code that is used in private. Todd first prepares the private image registries so that Jane, when ready, can add Stock Trader in a consistent way. He then looks at the Helm chart catalog in both clusters. Here he finds some differences in what each cloud shows by default. However, he also finds that he can use the same Helm charts, specifically DB2, MQ, Redis, and IBM Public, as he did in IBM Cloud Private. For example, here Todd selects the Helm chart catalog in Cloud Private. He opens the MQ chart and studies it in detail. He sees he can run a command to deploy the chart, and while he used the UI before to deploy, he switches to the CLI to automate deployment across both clouds. In the terminal, Todd uses the helm install command to deploy MQ onto IBM Cloud Private. Todd then uses the exact same command, which points to the exact same helm chart, and deploys MQ into IBM's public cloud. He repeats this for all needed middleware, and now he and Jane have a consistent experience across IBM Cloud clusters. Once running, Todd can manage and configure MQ in both private and public clouds using the MQ admin console that he's familiar with, which was deployed using that MQ Helm chart. Now it's Jane's turn. She wants StockTrader to run in the public dev test cluster with no code changes using the services Todd just deployed. She deploys StockTrader using her StockTrader Helm chart, which she loves since the Helm chart deploys not just the containers, but configures the needed network and storage. It's really a simple command. She confirms the microservices are running by using the kube control get pods command and then validates it by refreshing the kube dashboard already filtered to view only the stock trader namespace. Looks like a success. The only thing left for her to do now is to verify that what is running in production is also what's running in the dev test cloud. Yep, it works the same. And she noticed that Todd even pre-populated the public database with test data so she could test enhancements using relevant yet generic data. Now that Jane has her dev test cloud, she adds a Twitter notification microservice. Let's see it in action. Here, Jane creates a Think ICS portfolio, which uses the trader, portfolio microservices, and DB2. She then adds 1,000 shares of IBM stock, which use the stock quote and public quandle service. Notice the gold loyalty level. Jane opens her Twitter handle and sees that the notification microservice successfully used Twitter to announce the achieved loyalty level. Todd and Jane can now view logs and monitor their cluster and application in both IBM Cloud Private and IBM Kubernetes service. For example, Jane first wants to view logs put out in her production and test clouds. She opens logging in both clusters and sees that the Kibana dashboard is used across both. Jane adds columns of interest into Cloud Private's logging view, including container name and log message. She then does the same thing for her public development cloud. She does notice there are some visual differences, but still, Jane can easily filter and find the logs to help her troubleshoot in a pretty consistent way. Similarly, 
Jane opens monitoring in the IBM Container Service, and then in IBM Cloud Private. In Cloud Private, she can view a number of dashboards to help her troubleshoot. She first picks an overall performance dashboard where she can view cluster level performance, uptime, and cluster-wide container CPU and memory. Next, she selects a different Kubernetes monitoring dashboard to see pod utilization. But she really wants a view where she can filter based on namespace. So she selects namespace performance dashboard. Here, she selects the stock trader namespace to view the performance of the pods that are running the stock trader microservices. Similarly, on the public cloud side, she selects the stock trader namespace to see pod performance, CPU, and memory usage. Again, while there are visual differences, Jane is quite pleased at how she can monitor both environments so she can keep on top of any issues that might come up in her application. Now that stock trader works, Todd wants to simplify the test experience, but not requiring the testers to be DB2 admins. To do that, he wants to add a managed DB2 service in IBM Cloud, but it's got to have the requirement that Jane does not have to change any code. He first adds the DB2 service from IBM Cloud's catalog, and then views the instance in the IBM Cloud dashboard. From the DB2 service UI, he can manage details, scale the instance, and even open the console so he can create the tables and import test data. Next, Todd needs to tell StockTrader to use the new DB2 managed service. He already knows that Jane uses Kubernetes secrets as the method to pass in this kind of data into her microservices. So he deletes the old DB2 secret and adds a new secret that has the managed DB2 information. Finally, for the portfolio microservice to pull in that new data, he needs to delete the pod, which will instantly trigger Kubernetes to create a replacement. He goes back into StockTrader. He clicks refresh, and the test data from the managed DB2 service instantly appears. The result is that the app, with no code changes, can point to different DB2 instances by simply telling it where to get data from. Finally, the test team is ready to test with real production data, but Todd doesn't want to deploy the test code into the production cloud. So he updates this cloud architecture to pivot from the managed DB2 service to his local database running in IBM Cloud Private through a VPN. Well, this is now easy for Todd. He once again deletes the old DB2 secret, adds the new secret pointing to his on-prem database, he then bounces the portfolio pod to pick up the new information and refreshes the stock trader UI. Uh-oh, there is no data. Oh, that's right. He forgot to add the VPN into IBM Cloud Private that allows just the database to be connected to from their public dev test cluster. Thanks to the VPN Helm chart he used in IBM Public Cloud, he uses the same exact command to deploy the VPN into Cloud Private. The Helm chart output nicely offers a way to validate the connection is active. So Todd runs the two commands, first on Cloud Private, and then on Cloud Public. And as you see, the numbers are identical. Todd is now ready to do a final verification. He goes back to the Stock Trader UI in Private and Public, and refreshes the Public Stock Trader UI. As he expected, the UI has now showed data from the same local database, even though the public cluster is running dev test code and the private cluster is running production code. As a final test, Todd creates a portfolio called Think Local from Public from the public stock trader UI. And then he buys IBM stock. He refreshes the private stock trader UI, and sure enough, the data is the same. Finally, Todd opens the Twitter account and confirms that the change in loyalty level triggered a Twitter announcement using that local data. Of course, at some point, Todd could also pivot yet again to use his tried and true DB2 running in his data center from both his private and public clusters. 
As you can see, the cloud journey that Todd and Jane traveled was filled with consistent experiences across IBM's private and public cloud. And it enabled them to modernize, scale, and create a true hybrid solution that they can continue to expand for years to come. Thanks a lot.